Hi everybody, knowledge of the UK economy is absolutely fundamental when it comes to your essays and your exams this year. Examiners expect you to know a lot about the UK economy, to back up your points using stats, using knowledge about the UK, also in your evaluation, in your judgment, everywhere, especially in paper two essays. So make sure that everything in this video you take down, make sure you memorize it and then use it to smash those exams, show the examiner how well you know the UK. Here we go guys, we're going to start by looking at growth and unemployment in the UK. The UK annual growth rate in 2018 was only 1.4%. That is the lowest annual growth rate we've seen since our last recession. That's the impact that Brexit is having on the UK economy. And look at this figure, the quarterly growth rate. This is growth rate in the last quarter of 2018 was only 0.2%. You can see we're flirting with recession territory, aren't we? You know, that's close to a negative figure. Um, having said that, if we look at the forecast down below, economists don't expect there to be a recession this year. But you can see that Brexit really is slowing the economy down. In fact, growth forecasts are pretty bullish. This year, the OBR, this is a forecasting growth of only 1.2%, and that is because this is the year that we're officially leaving the European Union, all this Brexit mess is really impacting on growth. So quite a low uh, forecast growth rate for this year, 1.2%. But going forward, 1.4% in 2020, and then the three years going forward at 1.6%, we're expecting robust growth. But remember, all of those figures are very, very much dependent on what happens with Brexit. If we leave at the European Union with a deal, then we can expect decent growth rates going forward. But if we don't, who knows? These figures might be completely wrong. But let's say that correct. Um, you can see that Average growth rates in the UK really are quite low compared to what they were pre-crisis. Pre-crisis, we were getting annual growth rates of between two and two and a half percent. That was our long-term growth rate. That was our potential growth rate. But now, since the financial crisis, our long-term growth rates, potential growth rates, are around one and a half percent. That tells you the impact of the financial crisis. And because of that, the OBR have estimated that we are now in positive output gap territory. And that makes sense. If our long-term growth rate is around 1.5%, what kind of there, aren't we? Um, and they have said our positive output gap right now is at an estimated rate of 0.2% of GDP. Very interesting to know the impact of the financial crisis on long-term growth rates in the UK economy now at around 1.5%. It's crazy. Crazy when you think about it. Real GDP per capita, that's average incomes in the UK, around 29,000 pounds. Total GDP, uh, the size of our economy, two trillion pounds, but it's made up and constructed like this. 79% of all of our output is services. That's how dependent we are on services, how unbalanced the economy is. Services, that is financial services mainly, legal services, education services are at the heart of the UK economy. Only 14% of our output, of our GDP, is manufacturing. Very unbalanced. No wonder that a very, very weak powder has done very little benefit to the UK economy. We don't really manufacture much goods. 6% of our output is construction and 1% is agriculture. Very unbalanced economy, something that needs to be improved over time. Let's now look at unemployment. The UK's unemployment rate is 3.9%, record lows, the lowest rate since 1975. Even employment rates are very high, the highest rate since 1975. So record figures in the labour market. All the stats in the labour market are looking very positive. The OBR have estimated that the natural rate of unemployment in the UK is 4%, i.e. full employment occurs at 4%. Now we are below that. That matches their estimate of a positive output gap, doesn't it? If we're below the natural rate of unemployment with our unemployment rate, that must mean we're in a small positive output gap territory. So the labor market is very, very tight. These are good figures in the labor market. Youth unemployment rate, 11%, that's not bad, especially when you compare to Greece, Spain, Italy, youth unemployment rates there are much higher. But I reckon the UK government would like that to come down a little bit. Long-term unemployment is very low, 1.1%. Long-term unemployment is defined as unemployment lasting um, one year or more. And that's very low. Wage growth is 3.4%. That's quite high, especially when inflation is only 1.9% right now in the UK. That means real wages are rising. And that's a figure we expect to see when the labor market is very tight with unemployment rates very low. It's not surprising to see wage bargaining high and wage growth quite high. This is good news for workers. It means more real disposable income in their pockets. Um, and that figure is lagged. It's been a while since we've seen wage growth picking up beyond inflation. But for the last year or so, it's been consistently higher 
than inflation. That's annual wage growth there. Consumer confidence, though, has taken a big hit, especially since January. All this Brexit mess we are seeing is really causing concern with consumers. They don't know about their future. They don't know about their job prospects. They don't know about potential unemployment rates. And that's hitting consumer confidence. Since January, it's taken a real dive. Good to know that. Good to know that. But having said that, uh, retail sales figures recently have been very positive. So still consumers are spending, but they are very concerned about what Brexit means for the UK, the impact of Brexit on them and their personal finances. And then we look at income tax plans. Also good to know these because then we can see uh, what real disposable income levels are going to be like given how much income is taxed. And it's interesting to know. First of all, we have a progressive income tax. We all should know that. The first £12,500 of anybody's income is tax-free, so 0% paid on the first £12,500K. Good to know that that figure was £6,500 in 2010. So over the last kind of decade or so, we've seen consistent increases, widening of the income tax allowance, the amount of income you earn before you start paying any tax. That's quite a high figure now, really helping those on lower incomes. Any income between £12,500 and £50,000 is taxed at 20%. Again, in 2010, that figure wasn't £50,000, it was £37,800. So you can see again, that figure has increased substantially, giving a tax cut to many people in the UK. Any income between fifty grand and £150,000 is taxed at 40%. Any income above £150,000 is taxed at 45%. So that's our progressive income tax system in the UK as well. Let's now move from this and look at inflation and trade figures. UK CPI inflation stands at 1.9%, very close to the target of 2%. Expectations are that we are going to be at around 2% inflation as the year progresses, which is good news. That's the exact target that we go for in the UK. Core inflation, that's Mark Carney's preferred measure of inflation. Why? Because core inflation strips out volatile prices from the CPI basket. It's the CPI inflation rate without uh, fuel prices, gas, electricity prices, food prices, clothing prices. All of these prices are very volatile and can distort the final CPI rate. So take those out and we're left with core inflation, which gives you an underlying measure of the inflation rate, an underlying measure of how fast prices are rising of general goods and services in the economy. And that is 1.8%, very much matching the CPI inflation rate, which tells you that fuel prices, gas, electricity prices, uh, clothing prices, food prices are not distorting that final rate. Producer price inflation is a great figure for you to know because this is a future indicator of inflation. This measures the price rises of goods as they leave the factory, also known as factory gate inflation. If those prices are rising, it means that input prices are rising. And it also means that CPI inflation is likely to rise in the future because these goods will then end up in retail shops and their price increases will feed through to CPI. So this is a future indicator of CPI inflation. It stands at 2.4%, and that again matches what expectations of inflation are in the immediate short term. Whilst we expect 2% CPI as the year progresses, in the next month or two, we're expecting CPI inflation to be around 2.2%. Uh, which matches what we see with producer price inflation. But again, as the year progresses, that's expected to come down, which is why CPI is expected to be at around 2%. Inflation expectations, great stat for you to know because that figure drives wage growth. Inflation expectations are 2.7%, so no wonder we're seeing wage growth rates quite high, in fact, above the CPI inflation rate. We know that wage growth is 3.4%. Clearly, we're seeing real wage, real pay increases in the UK. As long as inflation expectations stay robust and stay high with a tight labor market, we can expect real wage increases as long as that figure remains higher than this figure. Good to know all of that. Let's move on to trade. The UK's current account deficit is quite large at 4.4% of GDP. What's interesting there is that the weak pound has done absolutely nothing to help the UK's current account deficit over time. In fact, since the weak pound, the UK's current account deficit has always hovered between 3 and 5%. There has been no long-term sustained improvement in the UK's current account deficit at all. Very interesting to know that. What are the major drivers of this deficit? Well, one reason is high incomes. We know that over the last two years or so, real incomes have risen and we suck in imports and more import expenditure, therefore. That is a reason, yes, but it's not the underlying reason. The underlying reason is structural issues in the UK economy, supply side issues, issues with productivity and investment in particular. Productivity since the financial crisis has been absolutely shocking. Here are some killer stats for you. 
Uh, productivity in the UK economy is 19% below the average of the G7, the seven most industrialized nations. We are 19% below the average of the G7 with productivity. And since the financial crisis, can you believe this? Productivity is 18% below the pre-crisis trend. In fact, productivity since the financial crisis has barely risen. So we're pretty much at the same productivity as we were a decade ago. Incredible to think, and no wonder our exports are not as competitive as we would like them to be, despite a very weak pound. Our productivity is horrible, horrible stats there. But also investment, as we know, since the Brexit vote, investment has been decimated. Why would you as a business invest when you're so uncertain about your future and your trade relations with your major exporter or major trade partner, which is the European Union? So investment has been decimated too, and that's all holding back competitiveness of UK exports and is a real driver of our persistent large current account deficit. Really shocking stats there. The exchange rate, the pound exchange rate, has been very, very weak since the Brexit vote, and we haven't seen a major, major recovery, a large recovery since then. The pound, as I'm talking now, can only buy $1.30, and when it comes to the euro, one pound is equal to one euro 16, very low rates, in fact, before the Brexit vote. The pound dollar exchange rate was one pound was one dollar fifty for the euros. One pound was one dollar thirty. So you can still see how weak the pound is. There is a slight recovery against the euro, but that's more the eurozone's weakness than it is the pound's strength. But I'll say it again: the weak pound really has done nothing long term to help the UK's current account deficit. All it's done is stoked inflation with the SRS shifting left. There has been no real benefit to the current account at all. Uh, good to know about the Eurozone and the US because they're our major trading partners. If those economies are doing well, that means our exports can be boosted. But in the Eurozone, their, their economy is slowing down big time. Trade concerns, um, issues with Chinese growth as well is slowing down growth in the Eurozone economy. Uh, annual growth in the Eurozone this year is expected to be only 1%. That's not good then for us, the UK, when it comes to export demand. But the US economy is doing very well. They're at full employment. Annual growth rates of around 3%. That's very, very high for a developed economy. So good news when it comes to demand for UK exports. But as we say, it's not demand side factors that drive the UK's current account deficit and therefore will improve the UK's current account position. It's structural issues, those need to be solved. Supply side policies is what we need to deal with the underlying issues right there. Let's finish off guys and let's talk about government finances and interest rates in the UK. The UK budget deficit is 2% of GDP. Remember that's annual borrowing by the UK government. At around 2% of GDP, that's 41 billion pounds approximately. Now it's interesting to know that figure of 2% of GDP because when austerity started in 2010, our budget deficit was around 10% of GDP. That's huge. So it's fallen dramatically since austerity started and it's expected to fall further to 0.8% of GDP by 2023, although that is heavily dependent on the relatively strong growth rates that we learned before. Uh, if those growth rates don't hold, then we might not get that figure. But yeah, 2% of GDP, maybe more interesting is to know that we are at pretty much full employment, right? We've said that the UK economy is essentially at full employment and even at full employment, we are running a budget deficit. That means we are running a structural budget deficit, although that figure is expected to fall as the years go on. The government national debt, that's the total stock of government debt, stands at 83% of GDP. But again, that figure is expected to fall, forecast to fall, to 74% of GDP by 2023. Again, heavily dependent on those growth rates that we learned before. Bond yields, a great figure for you to know, because bond yields are representative of the cost of borrowing to the UK government when they issue debt, and that stands at 1%. So it's very cheap right now for the UK government to borrow and to spend. And that again is because of austerity. They are seen as a relatively safe um, borrower now, very safe to lend money to. And that means interest rates on government bonds can come down. It's cheap for the government to borrow. Income tax bans, we learned this before, remember? On the first 12 and a half thousand pounds of individual income, uh, that's tax-free, 0% tax to pay on that. Between 12 and a half thousand pounds and 50,000 pounds, you pay 20% income tax. Between 50,000 pounds and 150,000 pounds, 40% income tax, and any income above £150,000 is taxed at 45%. And remember that that figure was £6,500 in 2010. So the tax free allowance has increased significantly since then. And also the rate at which you start paying 40% tax has increased dramatically as well. It was around the £37,000 mark in 2010. Now it's £50,000 as of April the 1st. So good to know those essentially tax cuts that we've seen. Corporation tax, can you believe it was 28% in 2010. Now it's 
was 19%. So big cuts in corporation tax through the Conservative Party since 2010. And they've said that figure can fall further to 17% uh, in the coming years. VAT stands at 20%. Our Gini coefficient is at 0.34. Good stat for you to know why. Because since austerity started, the Gini coefficient has actually fallen. It was 0.36 in 2010. Now it's 0.34. It tells you a lot about the nature of austerity in this country. It's not been traditional like we've seen in Greece and Italy. And maybe that's why the Gini coefficient has come down. Although having said that, our Gini coefficient is still much higher than the average in OECD countries. So it's still high relative income inequality in the UK. Let's now talk about interest rates. Bank of England base rate is 0.75%, very, very low. We've seen two recent interest rate rises in the UK. The first one was in November 2017 from 0.25% to 0.5%. The most recent rate rise was July 2018 from 0.5% to now 0.75%, but still very, very low rates. Those low rates are translating into generally low interest rates throughout the economy. You can see the average lending rate by banks is 1%. The average mortgage rate is 1.75%. That's the first time buyers looking for a two-year fixed mortgage. So you can see it's feeding through, but some good evaluation points. We know consumer confidence is low. Very weak since January this year, the Brexit mess is leading to that. Business confidence, very, very weak since the Brexit vote. Again, why would businesses invest when they're so uncertain about the future? So good ways to evaluate the very low interest rates. Uh, even though we see very low rates, we're not expecting much borrowing to fund spending or investment. We can see the housing market is flat. That's a very good sign of low consumer confidence. You don't see much uh, uh, mortgage approvals, flat growth with mortgage approvals, very flat housing market. House prices are rising very, very slowly, if at all. Um, and again, you expect that with weak consumer confidence. The level of QE, no, that total amount of money pumped in the UK economy because of QE stands at 435 billion pounds. Remember that the most recent increase in QE came in August 2016 with £60 billion of money pumped into the UK then to try and stave off a recession after the Brexit vote. Uh, the willingness to lend, more good evaluation here, is still quite weak. It was very, very poor after the financial crisis, up to 2016, very, very weak. Banks were very pessimistic, not willing to lend to anybody really. Since 2016, there has been an increase, but not really to small and medium enterprises in much uh, in much value, to be honest with you. If you talk to small and medium enterprises, they'll still say that the bank is a shot door if they're looking for a loan. So even though we've seen slight increases since 2016, banks are still quite pessimistic. Their confidence is still quite low. They're still quite concerned about risky lending, especially to small and medium enterprises. That's good evaluation to very low interest rates as well. So that covers it, guys. That's all the key stats that you need to know about the UK economy, the big ones that are gonna feature a lot in your essays. Make sure you've taken all that down, you're adding it to your notes, and then you're memorizing it, using it in your essays when those exams come, showcasing that talent, getting those top grades, showing the examiner you know everything about the UK economy. But make sure, guys, you also stay tuned for the next very important video where we look at supply side policies currently being used by the UK government to improve several underlying issues in the UK economy. That video is fundamental as well to add to all of this stuff. But thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you all in that crucial video next. This is massive. Thank you.